For the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. And what are some of the things that you've really run out of time? And, I, and we've got to talk about your latest. I want to go back a little bit, first of all, and celebrate a true legend. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. And did you pursue performing opportunities while you were in high school? Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's, Here's Richard, Richard Skipper. Skipper. Happy Wednesday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating tonight? I'm celebrating the fact that we're finally on the air tonight. For some reason, when we went live tonight or when we tried to go live tonight, I kept getting an announcement that there was a lot of traffic tonight uh, on the airwaves. So a lot of people are on StreamYard tonight, but hopefully a lot of people are coming right here. Something else that I'm celebrating tonight is uh, someone that I think is becoming a good friend of mine, and that's Spencer Garrett, who's a little off-center right now. There you go. Well, why, that, shouldn't he, why shouldn't he be off-center? Uh, because he is appearing right now on what has become a guilty pleasure of mine, uh, and that is The Winning Time. On HBO, if you're not watching this show, you are missing one of the most exciting series that I have been watching uh, that has been on. Uh, I, I can't wait for each episode each week. Uh, and it's funny because when Spencer reached out to me, uh, he said to me, uh, I don't know if you're a sports fan or not. It doesn't matter if you're a sports fan or not. Right. Because right. it is such a nail biting show. Uh, the intrigue of what's going on behind the scenes. And each day uh, I pull a word uh, for my word of the day. And the word for the day is fairness. And I, <laughs> I think that's the appropriate word for tonight because uh, that's a theme that runs throughout this series uh, whether it's about fairness or not. And we're going to talk about those themes tonight, not only in this series, but in the very business that you're in. So Spencer, first of all, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I'm thrilled that you're here. Uh, and I want to ask, first of all, how's your mom doing? She's doing great, Richard. Thank you, buddy. I, thank you for asking. I'm so happy to be here with you and I'm celebrating you on this Wednesday. So uh, I'm really, it's an, it's an honor to be with you and, uh, and thanks, Ben. So let's talk about the winning time. Uh, first of all, how did this show come about and were you familiar with the book before you got this role? I was familiar with the book. Uh, I actually had a copy of the book in my library. I'd read it several years ago when it came out. I'm an old, I'm a big Laker fan from way back. Um, and the, one of our writers, a terrific guy named Jim Hecht, uh, had this idea that he wanted to make uh, a limited series. He wanted to sort of do a true detective type limited series uh, about the Lakers. And he optioned the book and he went to uh, the great Jeff Perlman who wrote it and uh, and said, I, I, I somehow, some way, I want to turn this thing into a series and bring it to the screen. And Adam McKay got involved, the great Adam McKay from Anchorman and Vice and uh, Don't Look Up. And uh, several years in the making, and two other wonderful writers, Max Bornstein and Rodney Barnes, jumped on board, and they created this really kind of a masterpiece. I mean, if you're a fan of Succession, uh, which God knows I am, I'm obsessed with Succession. Yeah, absolutely. Another, another Adam McKay show. And so it has the richness of the characters and great writing. And like I said to you earlier, even if you're not a sports fan or a Laker fan, it takes you back in time to 1979. Um, and I remember being in LA in 79 and going to Laker games and Magic and Kareem and Chick Hearn and the Lakers, the showtime of it all. It was, they were the rock stars of LA at the time. And Jerry Buss, who's beautifully played by by John C. Riley, uh, decided to turn this, this franchise into, uh, into, uh, into a Hollywood sort of uh, spectacle. And he attracted Jack Nicholson and rock stars and movie stars. And it really became the place to be. The forum became the place to be. So 
all of those elements. And then you add in uh, wonderful Magic Johnson being played by Quincy Isaiah. And you'll see in a couple of episodes, uh, Larry Bird, who is uh, Sean Patrick Small, uh, the great rivalry between the Lakers and the Celtics. So you've got class and race and all sorts of wonderful elements that sort of come together in this big stew. And uh, only three episodes in, and we've got seven more to go. So it's wow. It, I mean, it is such a nail biter. Yeah. And I want to ask, who is the cinematographer for this film? Because uh, you know, the other night my partner said, "When was this filmed?" Because yeah. it looks like it was filmed in the seventies. He's a genius. His name is Todd Bonzal, and he uh, they shot this on thirty-five millimeter and Super Eight with a Super Eight camera, and there's a special camera of which I understand there's only a few of them in the world. It's called an Ikigami that has that quality, that grainy VHS quality. Uh, it's just, it's a, the, the, the cinematography is amazing. And I was watching episode three the other night with some of the castmates. And I saw at one point, cause nobody, nothing shot on film really anymore. And I saw like a hair in the gate. I saw like a little <laughs> piece of fuzz yes. like, flickering in the corner and I thought, God, that's genius. I, I mean, if they if they didn't know it was there, uh, you know, they do now. But I, I hope that they had the the wisdom to leave that in because it was such a great touch. I love the little hair in the gate because they always check the gate. Back in the old days of film, they would check the gate to make sure there was no fuzz or hair. And so it's just, man, it's just so much fun to watch. And it just, it really takes you back in time. But I'm glad you recognize the great cinematography because they just did an extraordinary job. And wait till you see in a couple of weeks time as we get into the basketball of it all and the Lakers really start playing the games and running up and down the court and you see the, the, the action of the basketball. It's really just thrilling to watch. Well, I want to talk about your character. First of all, how did you go about, well, let's bring up a photograph here. Look at you. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Now, talk about a transformation. Is that uh, wild? Yeah. Yes. So what was your process? I mean, how did you go about uh, auditioning for this role? Did they call you in specifically for this role? Uh, and yeah. I mean, I, I, I had an audition. This is now two and a half years ago, okay. mind you. We shot the pilot two and a half years ago, and, and then we were picked up a few months later. We were supposed to go into production in the spring of 2020, and then the pandemic put a wrench in all of our plans and we shut down for a year. So we didn't really, we, so there's two years between that photograph uh, actually. And, and what I looked like earlier in the pilot episode, different hair and makeup team. So a lot of the elements of the prosthesis were, were a little bit different, but uh, a great, uh, a great uh, Oscar winning uh, makeup artist, a woman named Kate Bisco. Uh, designed the look of Chick. I very much wanted to look as much like him as I can because I look nothing like him. Uh, he had this sort of wonderful long beak of a nose and a square chin. There he is. Um, yeah, I know it's crazy. And uh, but you, between between that and uh, putting on the clothes and sitting in the makeup chair for three hours, and when it was all over, and I look at myself in the mirror every morning at five o'clock in the morning. And once I slip on that beautiful polyester jacket and those and those 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 lovely slip on loafers and, and, and how can you not go right into that character? How can you, you not? How can you not? And then, you know, so I had an audition for it and uh, I went in and there was something like 15 pages of dialogue of chick speaking. <laughs> and stuff. There he is. There he is. That was from a little uh, behind the scenes promo shoot we shot uh, midway through. Uh, I love that. I love that picture. But it, it, I mean, it's it's uh, wonderful. And uh, for those who don't know who Chick is, tell everyone a little bit about who he is and how integral he is to this story. Chick Hearn was the voice of the Los Angeles Lakers for 41 years straight. He called uh, the play-by-play -play for 3,338 consecutive games. Um, pretty extraordinary when you think about it. I mean just the the work ethic alone and to be able to do that consistently over such a long period of time is amazing. He was a he was an LA icon. He's one of two uh two or three uh sportscasters. I know he's he's the first uh first sportscaster in the basketball hall of fame. Um you probably heard of Vince Scully. He was the voice of, of the LA Dodgers. Yeah. There're not too many not too many uh, Vin is in the in the baseball hall of fame. 
uh, Chick was the voice of the Lakers and, and he had, they called him old golden throat and he had just this beautiful voice and he coined all of these, what they call Chickisms. Uh, he said he, the term swish, the term slam dunk, uh, the mustard is off the hot dog. Yes. And when a game was over, he would say, this game is in the refrigerator, folks. The lights are out. The door is closed. The butter's getting hard. The eggs are cooling and the jello is jiggling. And that and was his people tuned in to hear those uh, expressions. Yes, exactly. So that was, those are five of maybe 200 chickisms that he had over the course of a 41 year career. His vocal dexterity and the way he was able to call games and throw in his opinions about the players. And uh, it was just gorgeous to watch. So I prepared for my audition by watching YouTube videos of him. Mm -hmm. And went in and read the sort of 15 pages of of him calling the games just nonstop and, and was lucky enough to get the job. And then once I once I was hired, I just went on YouTube and I watched probably 100 hours of Laker games uh, of, of, of Chick calling the games, Chick interviewing the various players. He had such a lovely rapport with all his players, with Magic and Kareem and even the opposing players with Larry Bird. He had a great, just such an ease with, with, with everyone that he spoke to. And he was really a beloved member of, of the Laker team. He was kind of like the, you know, he was like, he was the, the 11th man off the bench. I mean, he really, his banner hangs in the forum in the Staples Center now, and uh, there's a statue of him in front of the stadium. Uh, and so it, it, it's really, it's really an honor to play him. I mean, he was really an extraordinary man. And without giving away too much of the plot, um, his relationship with Pat Riley. Pat Riley, not a lot of people know. I didn't. I didn't know that. Uh, you know, everybody's image of Pat Riley with the slick back hair and the Armani suits, looking very s slick and cool on the on the sidelines. Pat was a, a former player. He won a championship with the Lakers in 1972. And then he was kind of bumming around for several years after that. Trying, He was in the league for many years, uh, played for the Lakers, played for the Knicks, kind of bounced around, sort of a journeyman player. But he won a, he won a ring with the Lakers in 72. And then after that, he was kind of like, what am I going to do with my life? And he, in episode three, as you saw, he, he comes to Chick's office, kind of hat in hand, looking for something to do. I'll do anything. And so he makes an audition tape and... Uh, and he eventually becomes Chick's, uh, his side man, his color man. And for for several months, uh, Chick Hearn sat at Pat Riley's side, or Pat Riley sat at Chick Hearn's side and and helped helped him call the games and, and called color for the games before he eventually graduated. And we became... haven't gotten to that part of the story yet, though. And <laughs> you'll, you'll 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 see you'll yeah. see that you'll see that very soon. Um, um, but that that's sort of I'm not I'm the cat's not out of the bag. I'm not I'm not. Uh, I'm not giving too much away to say that Pat Riley eventually becomes the coach of the Well, Lakers. anyone who knows the story knows yes. that's what happened. Exactly. But, you know, when he first came to him, I mean, it didn't happen that smoothly. Right. Um, but have in your career, have you ever had a moment uh, also in your career, hopefully not, where you've had a low point in your career that you had to get through a hurdle such as Pat Riley did in his career, and never, if so, never, never. Of course, I have. <laughs> of course, and I if have. so, I'm asking for all of those out there who are struggling, uh, and how you got through it. I mean, you know my history a little bit. You know, I'm a, I'm a third generation actor. My grandparents uh, had a theater on the Goldenrod Showboat, and showboat. In, in, you know, the Mississippi River in St. Louis and raised my mom and my aunt, who are both actors. And so it's it's my family business. It's in my it's in my blood. And I always say if, if I had the sense God gave a donut, I would have done anything else. But I was drawn to this circus that I'm in and I love it. And I've been doing it for 35 years. And so it's this is the life, you know, I mean, it's uh, it's, a, it's a roller coaster ride. And there are highs and there are lows, and uh, the highs are great and the lows are a bummer. And you, I, I learned to live by Winston Churchill's maxim: if you're going through hell, keep going. Keep going um, through hell. You well, know. you know, I look. You know, there are so many of us who aspire to a life in this business. Yeah. And we see it from afar. 
Yeah. And our aspirations to be in this business are based on what we see from afar. You, of course, are uh, thrust into it. Uh, you're seeing it from the inside out. Uh, so when you're coming from it from that point of view, uh, and you have a different or a skewed way of looking at it, uh, at what point do you say, this is indeed what I want to do with my life? When was wow. that decision made for you by you? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I think when I started, I moved out to, I did a little bit of theater and some a little bit of film work in New York before I moved out to Los Angeles in the late 80s, early 90s. And I had a, I kind of came off, I started off right out of the gate, kind of hot. And, and I very quickly, I learned that that doesn't last very long, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I also, I, I sort of knew that I had many object lessons from my family coming in. So I kind of knew what to expect. My father was a talent agent who, who was supportive of me, but he was like, you know, you don't have to do this. Um, but I wanted to, I wanted to try it. And so I started out, things were going well, and then there was sort of a dip. And probably about five years in, I started to question, gosh, am I really, uh, am I right for this? Do I have the, do I have the intestinal fortitude to, to keep, to keep going? And I, I, I kept studying. I kept. I kept trying to learn and kept trying to grow. I always stayed in class, and I think once I, I sort of came out that came out of that initial dip and started working again, and then found a nice little groove for myself, and that's when I thought, okay, I'm I'm going to hang on. I'm I'm staying on this ride as long as I can. Um, there's never been a point really where I where I said to myself. That's it. I'm done. I'm out. I haven't. I mean, I've never gotten to that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm. I'm happy to say uh, that every time I show up on a set, no matter what the job is, if it's a little indie film, uh, if it's a little off Broadway play or something here in LA, a little a little black box theater, or a big movie like Air Force One or Public Enemies or this extraordinary project, I pull onto the set in my car and I get out and I sit in the makeup chair and I'm just so thrilled to be there. I've never lost my enthusiasm for the fact that I'm so lucky to get to do what I love so much. I've never lost my love for it ever. The day that I do is when I'll say, okay, it's time to hang up my spurs and try something else. But I, I'm, I, I truly can say Richard that I, I love this so much and I really feel super fortunate that I've been able to do it as long as I have. And I mean, I'm, I'm working on this show six months ago and I'm, they're putting my face and my nose on and I'm playing this iconic character and I look over and there's Sally Field sitting in the makeup chair next to me. And I go, what it was is brilliant? I mean, let, let's talk, you know, let's go oh, there boy. since you're there. Let's cast. talk about the casting in this series. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, I look at this cast and not only, uh, are you sharing this uh, film with these incredible Adrian Brody? Actors. I mean, Adrian, Adrian Brody is just as Pat Riley. Oh my God, extraordinary! And but but they're all working with you, so that's the well, that's, bless you. <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> that's very sweet of you to say. I I mean that's that's a lovely lovely of you to say. I mean I'm I've known John C for many years. Uh, Jason Clark, who plays Jerry West. He and I have known each other since 2007. We did Public Enemies together. A lot of these folks I, I've known and I've crossed paths with over the years. But to be to share the same show as all of them, um, the casting really is something that's just off the charts great. How they found Francine Maisler is an extraordinary mm. uh, casting director. And I know the great challenge for Adam McKay and this whole team was how do we find Magic Johnson? Find somebody <laughs> that has that kind of charisma and it was somebody who lights up a room and they found this kid quincy isaiah who's from lansing michigan uh just as magic johnson was or from the same same neck of the woods in michigan and man does he deliver it's just i mean every episode i just go God, that man. moment when his mom says never forget where you, you came, came from, from. Yep. and he says i don't think i could yeah. and it, i know i just got a yeah. chill yeah <laughs> Yeah, seriously. I mean, the way he delivered that line 
was so poignant. And that's Lisa Gay Hamilton, who plays his mom, who's been around forever. I uh, worked with her on The Practice years ago. So good. Rob Morgan, who plays his father. Just every single, every single person in this cast just brings it. I mean, it's just really a joy to watch. Yeah, it's really something. You talk about this love of the business, and I, I want to go once again back to your mom because yeah. it, it, the first uh, female president of SAG, the Screen Actors Guild, uh, and the work that she did and her activism yeah. in this business, and luckily, and everyone that's on YouTube, go and check out my interview uh, oh, with Kathleen Nolan. So uh, great. Such, one a, of your such a great day for her and for me. And she was so terrific with you. It was really a joy. It was a joy for me. Yeah. But I want to talk about, in it comes through her love of this business. Yeah. Uh, it's obviously that that is something that uh, has transferred to you. Uh, but the activism for you as well, is it there? Um, and um, what is the... What is that spark for you in this business that keeps you still going? Um, obviously, you love the business. You love the people that you work with. Uh, but what is what is the real spark deep down inside Spencer Garrett? Well, there are two, two parts to that question. I'll, and I'll talk about the activism in a second, because that's a huge part of my life and, and who I am. And I got that from my mom. I mean, I got that 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 love and and desire to be involved in social justice and and activism i mean from I'm, i remember her carrying me to era rallies on her shoulders when i was a little kid and you know it, it was very much a part of my dna growing up so uh that was never far from my sights and so when i started to become a grown up i knew that i had to put my heart into things like that as well things that i cared about but where my where my love for it comes really is not just the genetic aspect of it and having having a legacy of, mm -hmm. of uh, you know in my family, but really it's just the the idea that I can that I can go from job to job and sort of transform myself into these different characters, and I've gotten to do some 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 works of some wonderful writers uh, and and to be able to play different characters and put on different hats and all of it, all of the, just the theatricality of it is what, what I love so much. Not just the, um, not just the, the, the makeup chair and all of, I love everything about it. I love the, I love the, I love the craft service. I love the gossip. I love the, uh, being on the set and talking to the grips and the crew and all of that, just everything that goes into putting it together. I'm talking about film and TV. And then, Mm -hmm. with with theater when i was backstage here waiting for you um all the all the theater that i've done just the backstage banter with my fellow actors waiting to waiting to go on waiting in the wings there's so, there's just something about it that's so oh, thrilling. there's nothing like it nothing there, like it i mean there's really nothing like it i i my, the last the last play that i did uh was here in la at the geffen it was a, a lynn nottage play beautiful play called by the way meet vera stark and mm. i played two different characters and I'll never forget waiting in the wings to go on just that nervous energy, this, that buzz that you get that fills your body right before you're about to walk on on stage in front of 800 people or whatever it is. There's just something about it that I, that I just, I can't let go of that. I just love. You so just much. reminded me, Frank Langella in his autobiography, a brilliant book, by the way, yeah. have you read it? Yeah. In his autobiography, he talks about that moment when the first time that he stepped on stage, when you step from the darkness into the light. Yep. And do you remember the first time you stepped from the darkness into the light on stage? Wow. I mean, I did a play when I was in uh, when I was in junior high school in L.A. Um, and I remember getting my first laugh. Hmm. And and I just remember thinking, what? Wow, that was that's pretty great. Penelope Ann Miller, remember Penelope Ann Miller? Oh, yeah, of course. We we were we were the like the drama school. We're drama kids in in uh, in junior high school together. And uh, she was she went off she went off to become a star like right away. She was just wonderful. Still still is a wonderful wonderful Absolutely. actor. But I remember I remember getting my first laugh 
on stage and thinking, oh, this is pretty cool. I could get used to this. Um, there's something there's there's something about that that just kind of gets under your skin and into your into your body that you just want you want a little bit more of it. It's not the every actor has the look at me, look at me, look at me syndrome. That's what that's part of why we do it. Um, but it's something about uh, getting that laugh and knowing that the way I delivered that line made people in the audience laugh. Uh, what a, what a thrill that is. And, uh, or even when we shot the, when we shot the pilot, the end of the pilot for the, for the Lakers show a couple of years ago, it's a scene that got cut from the pilot, unfortunately, but it's the first time you see Chick Hearn and he's calling a game in a summer league basketball game. And I had to do just continuous dialogue just for, for 10 minutes straight, just talking nonstop like Chick Hearn did. And, and I'll never forget uh, the, the, we shot it in a gym in East LA and there was 500 extras and all the crew. And I was just exhausted by the end of it. And I was also nervous because I wanted to get it right for Adam mm -hmm. and everybody was waiting to see how Chick were. It's the first time you heard Chick Hearn really. And, uh, and all the, all of the background actors stood up and applauded and, and McKay got on a microphone and said, Spencer Garrett, ladies and gentlemen. And, mm. You know, and I just thought, oh God, I, I, when you deliver and you know that you, you, you've done your job, um, it's, that's just oh, no better feeling than that. That's wonderful. Yeah. I want to talk about various people in your life and career. And I want to start with your dad uh, and what he instilled in you as an artist uh, and as a man. Uh, you know, that the life lessons that you've carried through out your career, the things that he has taught you that you've carried through in terms of your everyday dealings with the people that you deal with in this business. Well, my dad was an interesting character. He was a very, um, uh, very beloved character in, in, in LA out here. He was a talent agent for 50 years. He was a manager and an agent. Um, he represented everybody from Oliver Reed to Timothy Dalton to Donald Pleasance. He had a lot of English clients, um, loved loved actors and, and loved being in the business. I think he was wary of his kid being in the business. So the, there wasn't an initial like, go get him, kid. It was he wanted to make sure that I was going to be OK. So uh, his his advice to me was. Um, it's 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 a it's an old phrase and not a not a delicate one, but he said, "Just remember, kid, it's all horse shit and honeysuckle. It's either, <laughs> it's either, it's either horse shit or honeysuckle." Uh, and that's the title of your book. That's it. <laughs> that's, that's the title of my book, and uh, and then of course my tombstone is going to say, uh, "Here lies that guy from that thing," um, okay. because I I at, at any given time during the course of my life here somebody will come up to me in an airport and say aren't you that guy from the thing you 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 were that guy in that thing right um but yeah horseshit and honeysuckle i mean it's it's uh it, it puts it all in perspective well, I, well it's so funny because you know i live here in rockland county yeah and uh rosie o'donnell uh used to live here in my yeah. and she said that one time a, a woman Niagara. walked up to her and said um i don't mean to offend you but has anyone ever told you you look like rosie o'donnell <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, somebody said that to to Rosie. Yes. <laughs> How funny. Um, yeah. My my dad would always say, uh, "It's a line from The Godfather." Just remember, it's not. Don't take it personally. It's strictly business. It's strictly don't take, business. Don't take it personally. Um, business. If somebody takes a takes a jab at you, um, get up and keep going. It's it's uh, it's it's a business, and not to take it personally. Because I've had a lot of auditions. God knows we all have as actors where you 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 went in and you you thought you just knocked it out of the park and then you didn't hear a word. And uh, there's a lot of rejection. There's a lot of doors that get slammed in your face. And I think I took it when I was a kid, when I started out at 25, 26, I tended to take it personally because mm -hmm. I thought, well, gosh, I'm I'm pretty good at what I do. Why aren't I getting every single job that I go in to read for? Well, you learn pretty quickly that you're not going to get every single job you read for. And uh, and there's always 10 guys behind you. And 
that's what's also something that my dad instilled in me too. He's like, there's always, if they don't want you, they want the, the they want the guy right behind you. So you gotta be, you gotta be really good. Um, be so good when you audition that they won't forget you. And that's what I, that's what I tried to do. Uh, now, do you like to audition? Some I, I actually do. I love to audition. I love to audition. I love the I I love the the energy of the room when you walk in. Uh, I love the vibe. I I use the nervous energy to my advantage. Um, it took me a while to get that mm -hmm. good at it, but then I grew to really love it because it's a, for an actor, it's it's a chance to act. Um, it's your five minutes to be mm -hmm. on stage in front of whoever the decision makers are. Uh, they're the ones that are going to hire you for this episode of ER or NYPD Blue or Law and Order, whatever it is. You you walk into that room and you've got your sides and this is your chance to act and show off your wares and show them what you can do. So I love it. Unfortunately, it's kind of we're sort of in a new we're in a new era now where I, my last in-person audition in a room like that was for the Laker thing two and a half years wow. ago. Um, wow. It's been all it's been all self tapes. Everything's uh, uh, everything's self tape. Everything's self tape now, and I'm trying to learn how to love that as well. It's it's like acting in a vacuum. It's a different vibe entirely, as you know. I mean, you're not there's no energy. You're reading with a buddy on the other side of a an iPhone uh, and a ring light, and um, there's no feedback. Sometimes you never even know if they've seen the tape or not. So it's a it's a different vibe. So I miss that. I hope we. Uh, the pandemic had a lot to do with it. I hope that we eventually get back into the world of auditioning in person because that's what actors, that's what we, that's what we like to do. We, we, we like to go in the room and show our stuff, you know? And how, you mentioned earlier rejection. How do you deal with rejection in this business? Uh, well, I... I think, I, like I said earlier, I, I I learned to try not to take it personally. Um, I would go to an audition and I would see the same 12 guys in the waiting room. And I'm friends with 10 of those 12 guys. We've all been around for the same period of time. I'm reading for the same role that these other guys are. We've, we've all been in the same rooms together. So um, one or the other of us is going to get the gig. And the next time somebody else will get the gig. Mm -hmm. So I, I just learned that to, to, to try to roll with the punches. Uh, it's funny. Sometimes I would walk into a room and, and a couple of the guys would sit up and go, Oh, here's Spencer Garrett. We might as well leave now. Uh, <laughs> and then I have those guys where I'm sitting in the room and they walk in, I go, Oh God, there's John. I should probably just throw my sides in the trash. So rejection is, it's a relative thing. I, uh, I, I've learned not to take it personally. Um, a lot of times when you walk in the room, they know when you're three feet in the door, if you're the guy or not. Um, well, Donna McKechnie tells a, a story that she went to an audition. They were looking for a Donna McKechnie type. Yes. And she didn't get the job. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Um, uh, I, I, it's a, a similar story, but a, a very dear friend of mine, uh, Stephen Weber, wonderful actor. Oh, I love Stephen. Wings yes. and so many, yes. so many great things. And one of the most talented, versatile actors I, I know, and he's a very dear friend for a long time. And I was at a voiceover audition for Mercedes Benz. And I went there and I had the copy and and it said a Steven Weber type. We wanted to sound like Steven Weber. And I and I got on my cell phone and I called I said, Weber, you gotta call your people and you got to get over here right now. They're looking for a, a, a you type. They want your voice. So he called his people and he got an audition. Eventually, he went in and, and read for the copy. Didn't get it. <laughs> uh, Richard Thomas. And Richard Thomas became the voice of Mercedes-Benz for a while. Oh, that is wild. Yeah. So uh, I, I I hope at some point I will get to read for a Spencer Garrett type. Well, I, I'm sure you will. I want to ask the same question that I asked about your dad with your mom, with uh, what she instilled in you. Uh, the le life lessons that you learned uh, both as an artist and as a man. Yeah. A a everything. I mean, every everything, everything flows through Kathleen, mm -hmm. through me. I, I mean, absolutely everything. Uh, I mean, when she was, when I was 12 or 13, she became, as you said, the first woman president of not just the Screen Actors Guild, but 
of a labor union in the world. And I knew that that was a pretty big deal. She ran against six guys and won with 63% of the vote or something. I mean, she was a powerhouse. And so she carried that energy around the house. Uh, she just she just broke barriers and glass ceilings everywhere she went. And it was it was thrilling to watch. And so I knew that I knew I knew mom was I knew mom was hot shit when I was growing up. And I also grew up watching her on television. I would come home from school and I would flip on the TV. Sometimes sometimes she'd be off testifying in front of Congress. And so I'd come home and I'd turn on the TV and and there she would be on the Big Valley or Gunsmoke or an old episode of The Real McCoys or something. So I knew mom was cool. I also knew that she was a terrific actor. Um, and I and also just knowing her history of not just having grown up with theatrical actor parents, but going off to New York as a teenager and waiting tables and and doing the grind before she got uh, before she got uh, Peter Pan. Um, being an usherette at the palace uh, when Judy Garland performed there. And then this great story that I think she told when she was with you. Well, do you want to, I mean, uh, let, let's bring that up for a moment uh, because this is, this year is the uh, 100th birthday of Judy Garland. Wow. Uh, and I also, uh, there's a possibility uh, that uh, Judy's uh, memorabilia may be going to the Hollywood Museum I'm working on something to make that happen. Hey. Judy uh, had her hand in getting uh, your mom uh, to Never Never Land. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so yeah. if you want to tell that story. Well, Judy was doing her show at the palace and mom was an usherette there. This is a couple of years before she had, she had kind of struck gold with her audition for uh, for Julie Stein and Betty Comden and, you know, the gang behind uh, 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 behind Peter Pan. And so Judy was performing and she struck up a friendship with mom. And Judy approached mom and said, I want to go up into the rafters, into the cheap seats and sit up there. Uh, mom, had, mom had said to Judy, I know your whole show. I know your whole act. And Judy said, oh, really? Do you? And she said, I'll, I'll do it for you. So Judy went up into the into the cheap seats and mom went on stage and sang a couple of the songs that Judy sang. And and that sort of I think that sort of cemented their friendship. And then uh, I'm not sure if, if, if it went from that to her auditioning for Peter Pan, but I'm sure that somehow there's a thread there because uh, mom was mom was she was she had good hustle back then. She she knew, and she also had the chops to back it up. Um, she still has a, a hell of a voice. She's a beautiful singer. So imagine her at seventeen or eighteen when she met Judy, performing for Judy. I would not have had the stones to do anything like that. But I mean, she did it. Great she did Judy it. Garland, and say, "I'm going to do your act. You sit up in the rafters, and I'm going to sing your act for you." That's cojones. That's chutzpah. That's chutzpah. Yes. yes. But you and your mom also, I mean, you talk, uh, your mom waited tables, and I know that you waited tables in New York. Yeah. I also have waited tables in New York. Uh, it takes a special skill to be able to do that. Yeah. And that's a life skill. Uh, you've paid your dues. Uh, that also gives you a skill that uh, to go through life uh, and do those things as well. Um what are some of the things that that instilled in you that I'm sure that to this day you respect those waiters when you go into a restaurant? I'm a good tipper. Uh, <laughs> I'm a good, yes. I'm a good tipper. I learned, I learned, I learned the good work ethic um, from, from waiting tables. I did it for about seven, eight years. I bounced around from restaurant to restaurant because I would get I would get an industrial film and I'd say to the manager, I, I got to go do this little industrial film in Weehawken, New Jersey mm -hmm. for three days. And the manager would say, oh, that's terrific. Have a good time. You're going to have a new different job when you get back. So I'd go, I'd bounce around from restaurant to restaurant. Finally, eventually I ended up working at Aurora, the one we talked about backstage mm -hmm. uh, with our friend Bismarck. But um, I, I loved waiting tables because you know what it was, uh, it was, there was a bit of there was an element of performance to it. I wasn't and you met a, great people, and you meet you meet great people. Um, 
half the people in restaurants are, are actors in New York. Right. So I was no different. And so I looked at it as um, I was I was kind of a bad waiter, but I was really kind of charming and funny. And so I used I used it as a way to kind of perform. And so I used my performance skills as a waiter at a place like Aurora, which was a three star, very staid. We had to polish our shoes and we had uniform inspection and all that before dinner service. And it was French service with the 17 forks mm -hmm. and all of that. And I was just, I didn't take it that seriously. And that's what kind of, uh, that's what I loved about it. I'd be, I'd be waiting on Henry Kissinger and cracking jokes at the table. Um, so I had, I had fun with it and I was good at it and I enjoyed it. And then eventually I moved out to LA and I did it a little bit before I, before I really kind of started to work and something you don't know. Uh, and it's actually something that I tell my, my acting students when I teach out here, I teach a, at a Meisner based school out here called the Ruskin you school. Beat me to my next question. So go oh, ahead. <laughs> um, no, but, but um, Richard, you know, 20 years in to, working as a as a as a working actor as a journeyman lunch pail character actor going from gig to gig as a jobber um had a really good run for a long time and then the writer's strike hit in 2007 and i was with some writer friends of mine at paramount i lived in an apartment across the street from paramount studios not far from where i am now and i was walking in circles carrying a picket sign with my writer friends in solidarity. I've always been a big union guy. So um, I'm carrying a picket sign and I thought, wow, uh, this is gonna go on for a while. I might I might have to, I gotta get a job. Um, I'm, not, I'm not pulling down millions of dollars a year. I'm like, a, I'm a journeyman character actor. So I thought I need to get, I need to, I need to keep the lights on. I went back to the guy that owned the restaurant that I first worked at when I moved to LA in 89. Uh, and he now at that point had had a restaurant in Beverly Hills. He had a place called Nick's Martini Lounge. That was sort of a, a fun, fancy kind of go-to watering hole for industry types. And, and I walked in and I said, Hey, Nick. Um, he's like, Oh my God, I'm so proud of you. I, I hadn't seen him in 20 years. And he said, I'm see, I see you all over TV and movies and you're doing so great. And I said, yeah, that's great. I need a job. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, the writers are on strike. I said, I can, is there anything here I can do? And he said, sure. He said, I just fired my maitre d' the other day. You want to be the maitre d'? And I said, when can I start? He said, tonight. I drove home, threw on a suit and tie, drove back. And I worked in this restaurant for four months during the writer's strike. And casting directors would come in and directors and actors, stars that I'd worked with. Um, and a lot of people said, God, you, do you really want to be doing that? I mean, do you want to be seen after 20 years as an actor uh, working in a restaurant again? I had no, I never gave it a second thought. I never, there was no ego involved. I was just like, I'm making I a living. I want to thank you for telling that story. I mean, talk about checking your ego at the door. That's really great. Right. I checked my ego at the door, Richard, and I just thought, I am, I'm getting paid to work. And... And I also, again, I was the maitre d, and I was seating people. And and uh, I remember, I remember a studio head who I who will remain nameless popped in, and and he sort of did a double take. He's like Spencer Garrett, I just hired you for blah blah. He said, "What are you doing here?" And I said, "Working, paying the rent. No shame in it. I mean, there's no." And I and I loved it. And again, it was a it was a it was a way for me to sort of perform. I was on the floor of the restaurant. And I was running around and changing tablecloths and serving martinis. And it was just another stage for me. Um, well, it was just so there wasn't a person in that restaurant who didn't know that there wasn't a strike going on, too. Yeah, but there, there was also a kind of it, this is a this is a business of perception, Richard. That's you know, true. It's, That's they, true. they see they see you working in a restaurant and and there's a all of a sudden they're sort of looking down a little bit. Um, or they're looking at you through a different perspective. And so, and I was aware of that and I knew that. And I just, I did, just didn't give a F, you know, I was just, I was there to work and, and I was making 15 bucks an hour. I was, I was getting a, a meal at the end of the night and a free martini. And I, and I did it for four months. In fact, I loved it so much in the middle of that, 
I got cast in a really big movie. I got Public Enemies for Michael Mann with Johnny Depp and Jason Clark, my co-star on Winning Time. Uh, all of a sudden, I'm on the floor of this restaurant. I get a call. You're going to Chicago. You're doing a Michael Mann movie. $200 million universal picture. You're going to be there for four months. And so the, the writer's strike, the, the easing out of the writer's strike, because this script had been written pre-strike. So they were able to bring it into production. Um, and that's how they were able to do the film. And so I was in Chicago shooting this film. And the way they structured it, if you had more than four days off at a time, uh, they could fly you home um, and then fly you back to Chicago for your next shoot date. So I would call the restaurant and I'd say, hey, I'm coming home from Chicago. Do you have any shifts for me? And so I'd go I'd go for my two hundred million dollar universal picture with Johnny Depp. And I'd go back to Beverly Hills and and uh, and schlep martinis on the floor for a couple of days before I went back, because you never know. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, I, I like to give a, a I, I give away a gift at the end of each show, and we're going to give away something tonight. Uh, I don't know yet what I'm going to give away, but I'm going to give away something. And uh, so I'm going to bring uh, this on screen here. And what I'm going to do here is um, the word for today is fairness. Uh, I mentioned that at the top of the show. Um, I want to ask you, in this business, what does the word fairness mean to you, especially in today's uh, world of this business? Um, well, the first thing that I thought of when I saw that pop up on screen, I've been watching the I've been watching the uh, the hearings of uh, Katanji Brown Johnson Jackson. Oh my god! Uh, and watching her get just uh, I I don't I don't want to I don't want to go there. It's been very difficult to watch. Well, go there for a minute. Go well, there. I I don't want to get I don't want to I'll go down a political rabbit hole that I shouldn't. So uh, just just watching her the way she's been treated the last two days is appalling. Mm -hmm. Um, and fairness is not a word that I would say would apply to, uh, the way she's been grilled and just, just yeah, broken down by, by certain, certain people that are just, just be clowning themselves and, exactly. and embarrassing themselves. Um, and it's really shameful. Uh, it's really, really shameful. She is vastly more qualified than half of the people that are asking her those questions and mm -hmm. uh and she she has comported herself with such dignity and grace and smarts and it's really it's inspiring to watch um absolutely and uh and obviously we're in a very racially divisive time in our country right now and uh and you know my show even deals with some of that going back to 79 and seeing a lot of the racial disparity we seem to have a rock seems to have been lifted up and and a lot of behaviors that we thought weren't uh, weren't around anymore have sort of come back into the fore and some people want to take us back to the 1950s and it's uh it's it's chilling and scary and and difficult to watch and she's just she has uh acted with such grace and dignity it's uh, it's incredible so fairness um I, I'm, I'm i'm all for it in my business uh, I would say how it applies now is uh, racial e racial equality or uh, uh, financial equality, um, pay equity uh, between men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, something that is the fact that we're even having that conversation now uh, is is kind of silly. The fact that women aren't getting paid the same as men is um, is really is is an, is another thing to be ashamed of. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so fairness, fairness in the workplace, fairness uh, between the genders. I, if, if women ran the world, we'd, we'd be a lot better off anyway. So, Absolutely. Now I'm pulling a random question. I haven't even looked at this question yet. Oh, wow. And the question is, if you could arm wrestle any historical figure, who <laughs> would you choose and why? <laughs> Gosh, arm wrestle. Well, I'm a terrible arm wrestler. <laughs> um, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, ah, good. <laughs> no, 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 no. Of course not. Um, I she would, would win. Uh, she would probably win. She could win. She's. A, I mean, did you see the way she, she was working out until the very yes, end? Yes. Um, she was in better shape than I am. Uh, I would say probably Muhammad Ali because I would have loved to have met him. Uh, he would he would put my arm through the table, but uh, to to be able to meet somebody that magnificent and uh, and to to give it to give a go with him, I would think would be would be kind of hilarious. But uh, Muhammad Ali. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah. So my homage to James Lipton inside the Actors Studio. Yes. So I've got some questions for oh, you. Well. Okay. And the first question is, what is the best and worst thing about the day that you had before you got here? Wow. The day before before I got here? No, today, what was the oh, best thing? Oh, the best thing and worst today? thing. Um, the best thing. I, uh, gosh, the best thing about today was I, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm above the grass. Uh, I'm, I'm healthy. Um, my mom's alive. I've got a great family and I, uh, had a fantastic cup of coffee at my favorite coffee place around the corner. And it's been a very good day. The worst thing about today, um, I, I didn't have a great night's sleep. So I'm, I, I woke up a little cranky. I'm, I'm, I'm not a good sleeper. So, uh, so I started off the day a little cranky and then I knew that I was coming on to talk to you and I've been looking forward to it all day. Yeah. Me and too. So you are you are the best thing that's happened to my day. Oh, that's a very kind thing to say. One hundred percent. Um. So, and I've talked about this on other shows. Uh, and I give uh, a shout out to uh, a previous guest, uh, Patricia Stark. Uh, mm -hmm. she wrote a book that I recommend to everybody called Confidence. Uh, C A L M F I D E N C E. Oh, I like that. And she talks about people that build up confidence in us. And I'd like you to name four people who build confidence up in you. Mm. Uh, definitely, definitely mom, definitely Kathleen. Um, my, my, my cousin, Melanie, who is the youngest daughter of my mom's sister, uh, lives in Maui. She made the decision many, many years ago, 30 years ago to leave New York. And she lives in Maui and she lives a very, uh, calm simple i saw centered, those great pictures <laughs> centered life and she's my uh uh she's probably the closest thing to a sister that i have uh because i'm an only child and so she always kind of brings me when it, when when the going gets tough she kind of brings me down to earth and always makes me feel good so i'll i'll shout out to uh uh to melanie and 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 her sister my other cousin martha lee they're like they're my sisters and they're just like my centers they 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 ground me and they're kind of my rock. And um, and then uh, I, I have to I have to say uh, Dana, uh, my girlfriend uh, who lives in D.C., but she's um, she's my best friend. And I don't know how she puts up with me uh, huh. in this in this nutty business. I, I truly don't. She's extraordinary. Uh, that's great. And I'd like you to list four people who, uh, well, I just asked that question. Well, I, I only gave you three. You, you oh, need one more? Okay, one more. Um, well, uh, I, I might have been, I would say, Mr. Meisner. He's no longer here, but wow. but, but Sandy Meisner was a great mentor uh, to me, a great teacher to me. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's where I got the, that's where I got the, the, the basis of my training. He was really tough on me as a, as a student and, and, and constantly, relentlessly tough on me. And I and I asked him years later, why were you so hard on me in class? And if you know how Sandy spoke, you know, he'd said, yeah, because you were good and I wanted to make you better. So um, shout out to uh, to Sandy, um, who was a great, great mentor and a, and a great friend. And he was tough on me and, and he should have been. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, do you journal? Uh, and if so, uh, would you consider writing your memoirs? I, I journaled off and on sporadically. I would start one, put it away. In fact, it, it, right in the other room, I've got probably a box of them that, uh, that I would start and stop over the years. And I should probably get back to it. I, I, that's a great reminder that I should go back to it and write down my, write down my thoughts um, while I still have a brain in my head. Um, I would I would write a memoir. I would definitely write a memoir. I've had a lot of really fun experiences. I've gotten to work with some extraordinary people that I never in my wildest dreams would think that I would get to work with. And so I've been really lucky. Um, so yeah, I would uh, I would I would write a memoir one day. Um, it would be I don't know. I, it would be uh, I don't know if it would be that spicy. It would be fairly just kind of work related, but. Um, between my family and a lot of the people that I've worked with, I think I think I could come up with some fun, some fun anecdotes. Oh, that's wonderful. A good life. Um, I practice gratitude. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you do too. Yes. Um, I'd like you to list three things that you are grateful for today. Uh, my health, uh, for sure. My health, um, the fact that I am, uh, that I'm working in a business that's very difficult and I'm feel like we talked about earlier, very, I just feel very fortunate that I am, uh, that I'm allowed to play in this ball game still, uh, after all these years, I feel very fortunate for that. I feel very fortunate for my health. And I feel um, uh, this might sound frivolous, but I'm glad that the uh, that the baseball season is coming back because I'm looking forward. No, to, that's great. For, I'm looking forward to my Dodgers and my Yankees. So good for you. Grateful, that's great. Grateful for baseball. Um, when did you have the strongest self confidence in your career? Oh boy, you know what I I now. I, I have, I'd have to say it's, it's now right. it's taken me 58 years to kind of settle into my body and to settle into the kind of work that I'm doing. And so um, probably, probably the last couple of years uh, with this particular job. And I feel like my work has gotten better and my work has gotten more interesting. And, um, and I, I'm always trying to be a better actor and learn how to be a better actor. And so I would say the last couple of years, I'm also, I mean, I always try to learn how to be a better person as well. And I think my, the trials and tribulations that come with mm -hmm. this insane roller coaster ride that I'm on have hopefully helped shape me and, and, and make me a better person. I hope people will say, I hope people will say about me when I'm six feet under that he was a good guy. Well, I'm sure they will. And I'm sure they're saying that now. Uh, what is the hardest decision that you've ever had to make in your career? Oh, golly. Um, that's a tough one. The hardest decision that I had to make. Um, I, I At one point, I was sort of at a crossroads early on, like we talked about earlier. I uh, I was offered a teaching opportunity at Duke University, where I went to college, and uh, and I was really, really torn uh, because I knew that's really around the time that I was I was kind of on the upswing and I was thinking, OK, I'm stick. I'm going to stick with this. And I somebody had offered me an opportunity to come in and teach. And I was sort of back and forth. I was really, really torn about just bagging it all and going and and having a regular job, a regular day to day job teaching, which is something that I love to do teaching students. Uh, and so that, that was a tough, that was a tough decision. That was a bit of a Sophie's choice. Do I just chuck it all and go and, and go to Durham and make $48,000 a year and be a teacher? Or do I keep, do I stay on this roller coaster and try to chug forward and, and make a go of it? Um, that was a, that was a, that was a tough decision. And mm. I, know I really, I really wrestled with that one for a long time. I'm sure there have been many other tough decisions, tougher than that, but that's the first thing that comes to mind. Now, this goes back to a comment that you just made. Yeah. Uh, how do you desire that others see you at this point in your life and career? Um, fairness, uh, going back to fairness, that he was, uh, that he's that he's a fair guy, um, that he looks out for his friends, uh, that he looks out for his family, that he cares about his fellow man um cares about the environment tries to do right uh tries to do right by others and um and tries to tries to do the right thing whenever he can um acting stuff aside i mean uh, mm -hmm. the, the, talking about just m me as a person um i'd, I'd like people to, to uh, when i'm when i'm long gone people can look back and say uh he was a good man good answer um when were you this is an interesting question and it's not easy and it's and it's and it's not always easy as you know yeah i'm i'm i'm, I'm a uh i saw a great uh, great uh, interview with with anthony hopkins who's somebody that i just mm. revere uh and i've worked with twice and um somebody asked him i think it was 60 minutes interview and said do you have any regrets he said no i have no regrets at all he said i'm a flawed man i'm a sinner um he said you 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 move on 
you 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 apologize for your sins and you try to learn from them whatever mm -hmm. they are and you and you move on so um i like that i like to say i have no regrets um i like to i'd like to think that i can uh as as flawed as i am as flawed as we all are that um whatever whatever i've done in the past i've learned from and i'm able to move on and 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 learn and grow from that same here yeah. uh, when were you the most moved by a ceremony ooh wow a ceremony i haven't been to too many ceremonies in the last couple of years no uh, none of uh, us have what's that yeah i mean I, it's been it's been a while it's gosh it's been like that my my sense of time and the time space continuum is a little bit warped because we're just now going back into um uh dana's uh my girlfriend's birthday maybe her 50th birthday uh, uh last year to um that i sort of helped put together and and uh and it was wonderful to see uh other people speak about her and how much and how much love they had for her uh, and how much goodness she brought to their life. I was very, I was very moved by that. Um, she's a role model for me as well. And I thought, God, I, I, I hope I can, I hope I can be like that when I grow up. So I was very, I was very moved by that. I was very touched by seeing how people spoke about her. And that's um, wonderful. Yeah, that's I love great. It. Yeah. And this is my last question for you. When was the, what was the poorest that you've ever been and how did you overcome it? Uh, Right when I got to LA, I had I was catering and waiting tables and all of that um, before I before I started to kind of catch on and, and work a little bit. And um, I remember I had a great baseball card collection. I had a really like top shelf collection of baseball cards, and I had some that were really worth a lot. And I I remember selling some of those baseball cards to to pay my rent um, and just like be, just being really like heart sick about that. Um, and I was selling personal stuff and trying, but the, the baseball cards was, was tough. And so I, um, that was a, t that was a tough thing to get through. I was only 22 or 23 or something. Um, and how I overcame it was years later, uh, I was able to, I'd made, I'd made enough money at, at a certain point that I remember walking into a baseball card shop in Beverly Hills and one of the cards that I'd sold 15 years earlier, I was able to buy back. Um, that was kind of satisfying. Wow. That Well, good for you. That's yeah. great. Only one of them. I sold about five of them, but the one that I, it was a Nolan Ryan rookie year baseball card. And I, and I, and I, and I remember I didn't even have enough money to buy it back really at that point, but I, said f it i'm gonna get this card back and stay. <laughs> so i still have it so when things get really tough uh if i might have to sell it again we'll see but wow well we're gonna give away an item i'm gonna show you how this works and, and it's I'm a little ryan baseball card everyone there it is oh, there it is uh, so uh oh, I love we'll this. yes and uh we'll see who the winner is and uh it's, it's so Francis cool Shea. Francis Shea. Yeah. Wow. so thank you francis uh reach out to me and uh I'll what did you win uh, we'll find out. Okay. It's up to her. So right. I'm going to take this off. Uh, I love Frances. She's a wonderful person. And I'm glad that she's here tonight. Spencer, I thank you so much for being oh, man. here. What a treat, Richard. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, for uh, Even with us being late tonight and everything, don't go anywhere for a moment. I want okay. to thank everybody uh, for tuning in tonight. Uh, if this was your first time here, don't let it be your last, please. Uh, please subscribe to this channel. Uh, leave uh, a message on uh, uh, the show. Tell your friends about the show um, and come back over and over and over again. Uh, and don't forget, Sunday night at nine o'clock Eastern time, time uh, it's the winning time. I mean, you are so incredible on this show. Thank and you. I am having so much fun with this show. Thank and you. Can, uh, I tell, can I tell your friends where to follow me on the uh on absolutely all of that. i'm on instagram uh at spencer garrett the number one and on the twitters i'm at at one spencer garrett 
So, and I'm going to have all that information on YouTube, so it'll be easy for people to oh, find great. all that oh, information, okay. so that everybody can find that. Don't go anywhere for a moment. I al uh, I always end every show by telling everyone, uh, hold on for a moment, Benny, come here for a second, um, because this is National Puppy Day. Hold on a yes. second. Come and here. also National Chia Day. Apparently. That's right. Come here, Benny. Uh, come here. Come here. Come here. You want a treat? Come here. Yeah. Come here. So let me. So here he is. So this Benny. Is, <laughs> this is oh, Benny. what a cutie. So, yeah. So go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Uh, go to your Facebook friends list and the fifth name that pops up, reach out with a phone call. Uh, not an email message, not a text message, not an inbox message, but a phone call. Spencer, I want you to do the same thing. I shall. Reach out with a phone call and I let shall. that person know what they mean to you. Uh, as my dear friend, uh, Sean Moniger always says, we're always in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And I always say, if you're going to go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. Have a good skipper along. So Absolutely. Spencer, I'm leave the screen and I'm going to give you the final word. Anything you want to say about anything that we talked about tonight that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message that you want to put out to anyone. And I hope you'll come back sometime. Will you do that? I will, Richard. I think you, I think you said it all. I, I, I mean, if you want to leave me with the final word. I'm going to leave you with the final word. It's all yours. Uh, I want to give you the screen to yourself. And uh, we'll talk soon, I hope. Thank you, my you friend. It. God bless. Um, be kind to each other, just for Pete's sake, just be kind to each other. Uh, you never know what somebody else is going through around the corner. So um, it's a really tough world right now. So be nice to each other, be kind to each other, lift each other up, uh, show some love. And like Richard said, I mean, reach out, reach out and call somebody and, and tell them you love them. Um, the best, the best advice, the best advice anybody could give. You just heard from Richard Skipper. So uh, be kind to one another, hug somebody you love, and uh, and we'll get through this. All right. Much love. Thanks, everybody, for watching.